Hey, let's stand to our feet. How are we feeling this morning, Destiny Hamilton? I said, how are we feeling? Let's stand to our feet. Let's lift up some praise. We're still on fire from conference, aren't we? Yeah, there we are. I can see the fire. I can see the fire. Doesn't it feel good to be back in the house? Lifting praise, fellowshipping. No place quite like home is there, Father.
Arena Church. Oh, awesome to be in the house of God this morning, eh? Beautiful, beautiful place to be. Beautiful place to start our week right here in the house of God. Let's give it up, let's give it up, church. Give it up for our amazing worship team. Born in the fire, eh? And this is where we get our breakthrough, right here. Sets us up for the week. Sets us up for life. Sets our next generation up. That's what we're all about, our next generation. So as you take a seat, just tell the person next to you, your breakthrough is here. Awesome. Just a big welcome to everybody here this morning. Just like to warmly welcome you. And uh, you know, on behalf of our pastors, our amazing pastors, Pastor John and Pastor Ali Ferris, welcome back in the house. I'm sure every single one of us missed you. So um, just a big warm welcome to all of us and even the ones that are new as well. We welcome you with open arms. Great to have you in the house this morning. Best decision you could have ever made is walk through those doors. So give yourself a pat on the back for that. Now we like to do things right and do things in order. We love to give. This house of destiny, we love to give. And it's not a thing of how much you give or, you know, what you give, but it's a heart thing. You know, if you get that principle right, we just give because you want to give, you freely give. I would suggest not to give if you're not giving freely. Is that right? Just give because you really want to give. Give because you, you can see bigger. You can see a future for you, your family, and future generations. That's what we're giving towards. Hey, so um, if you have your tithes, your offerings on you, just hold those up and I'll pray for them, eh? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Father, for a great day that you have made, Lord. Lord, Father, that we will be glad and we will rejoice in it, Heavenly Father. Lord, as we raise these tithes and offerings, these, these seeds, Lord, Father, we just, we give freely, Lord, Father. We give, Lord, Father, expectant of more souls in this house, Lord, Father. We give, Lord, that uh, this house be bigger and bigger and bigger, Lord, Father, that you work signs, wonders, and miracles, Father, continuously. So, Lord, as we offer up these seeds in our tithes, we thank you, and we all said, Amen. Awesome, church. So that's our giving. So let's just give it up, eh, for our youth. So we've got a a Youth Nation event, and it's a family movie night. That starts at 7 o'clock down here, and that's on the 28th of this month. So give it up to our, our youth. You know, doing a great job there, our leaders, you know, and um, they continue to support our young ones. So if you've got young ones, bring them along, you know. Like Elder Shan said, you know, the experience with Geordie, you know, if there's any little opportunity where he can get his son there, and he enjoys it, then take it. Hey, it's better to get that 15 minutes where they enjoy it instead of waiting five, year, five more years for them to come back into the church. All right? So sow that seed early with our kids. Our next notice, we've got our, our youth again. So they're keeping busy. Let's give a big hand, eh? So they got their, they're running a youth service, and that's on the 13th of August, all right, 10 a.m., same time, come along, bring all the youth that you know, all your sisters and brothers, kids, all the young youth, just bring them along, it's going to be amazing, there's going to be all sorts, as you can see up there, live performances, free haircuts, the guy that does my hair, he's pretty sharp, and he'll be down here cutting the hair, so take advantage of that. Awesome, what's on this week? Well, we've got a lot on. 
So Tuesday nights, we got our man ups and legacies. Let's give it up for the man up and legacy, eh? Awesome. And uh, you know, just just that alone, man up and legacy, it does great wonders, not only for us as facilitators, but for the people, the community, the men, the women, you know, out there in the community, they're looking for what we carry, hey, as facilitators. You know, so if you're a facilitator, big ups to you, a big hand for you guys, because you do amazing. And it's all voluntary, you know, so you can't ask for any better, you know. We run by the heart, not by the money. So there's your details up there for Man Up and Legacy. Let's give it up for Overcoming Anger, eh? That's an awesome, awesome uh, class there. And uh, not only for myself, it's helped me, but I've seen fruit from overcoming anger, you know? And um, if you don't believe me, best way is turn up. Just turn up there and find out for yourself. You'll know as soon as you walk in the door. Awesome. So we got Empower as well. That's on Wednesday. Let's give it up for Empower. General Sai and Orts. We thank you heaps for the time you, uh, you know, seed into into our people to help them move closer to God and have that relationship. Eh? And that's also on um, Thursdays, Man Up and Legacies, Empower. You know, so we don't fall short of any support in this house. We've got that huge wraparound to, to help not only our community, but the people in here to keep it strong in here, keep it strong in our home, then we can go out there and work wonders. Awesome. So, um, yeah, just uh, big big ups to all you guys for everything you do in your ministries and in Man Up and Legacy. Our next slide. So our kids' ministry, let's give a hand for our uh, DKs and All-Stars leaders. I had the privilege of being able to serve up in Auckland at the conference. Wasn't that amazing? Conference. Hey, it was amazing. So um, it was great just being up there and being able to see some of our Waikato kids up there as well. You know, and they notice you. They're like, oh, Cody, you know, this and that. So it was cool. You know, so we've got a space, a safe space up there with our leaders. Up here, Tamariki here, between the ages of two and four straight up the stairs and we've also got DKs which is in between the ages of 5 and 10. So just go up there, we've got a friendly team up there welcoming. So just take your kids up there then you can come back down here and receive the revelation for you. Kaapai. Awesome. Up next is our cafe. Let's give it up for our awesome cafe team mate. You know, they do awesome food there, great food, you know, and if you want to be able to taste some of that food, then go down there after service and they'll blow you away with their amazing hot chips and all the delicacies down there. So, awesome team. So you can go there straight after service and start ordering your kai. Last but not least is uh, ministry time. Okay. So, you know, you might have been going through a season Kapoi, everybody goes through seasons. Hey, everybody goes through those storms, but it's what you do from there. Hey, do you want to be stuck in that or do you want to be freed from it? You know, so this is opportunity that we give. You know, our leaders here, they care for you, they love for you. You know, so if there's anything that you're going through, don't be shy. You know, don't be fucking mad to come up and ask for that help because it might be that breakthrough of you just walking up here, getting your feet up here, that'll set you free. Sweet as it, it, you don't have to be new, you know, you can be been in the church for ages. Don't worry about who's looking either, because it's between you and him, not between you and your neighbor, right? So if there's anything at all, hey team, just come up, you know, don't be shy. I'll just hand it over to our awesome uh, worship team. Cool, thank you church. Check one. Good morning, church. We just, uh, we've got a new worship song this morning that uh, we're going to present. Glorified in His name, we worship you, Father. Unified as one.
Rain Church. Doesn't he rain? What a great finish. That's it. Lift it up. Lift it up. Lift it up. Check, check, check. Yeah, awesome. Hey, welcome everybody to the house of the Lord. Um, it's our honor and privilege to, uh, you know, share our welcoming back to our pastors today. Yeah, so, um, hey, welcome everybody. So, uh, I'm going to start us off with Māori and then going to get into what the pastors here. So, kia o tātou pāhita o te wai kato, no mai hoki mai, no ki te honore nui ki te whakatau i a kōrua, ki ringa i tēnei ahu rewa tapu o te ora ngāke. Hei, no tātou te maringa nui ki te tōhotoa i tō tātou aroha mō kōrua, hei, ki te whai a... Uh, I tō tātou karaiti ana tanga, nō kōrua tahi tērā kanohi kitea mō tātou i ringa i tēnei ao. Uh, mō ake tonu atu, e kore te aroha e maroke, e ka moke moke te uh, ngākau mō kōrua tahi. Uh, ia wā kei konei, kei tā wāhi ke, uh, he aroha e kore e tāia te uh, kupu ki te, uh, ki te toa toa i o tātou nei uh, aroha ki o kōrua. Nō reira, uh, nau mai, hoki mai o tātou pāita, ngā tumu whakarai, ngā māngai o tēnei whare o te atua. Uh, so, hey, it's an honour and privilege to welcome you back, pastors. Uh, try to hold back some tears. <laughs> We're digging deep, but, you know, just want to just, uh, on behalf of the church, our elders, our generals, our leaders, our past, present and future, um, people that you have so and so much, so much into a lot of people's life and we're forever grateful pastors always for you and your tamariki you know for you and your kids that it's awesome that um you know there's only a small token but i have called here iti here pronomri that it's only a a, 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 a what do you call it a, um, a symbol of our love for you you know there's more we could give you for eternity because that's how much treasure you have stored yeah so you know we could only just give you what the world gives but um, you know, God will always bless you abundantly. Um, so we just want to honor you, pastors, and welcome you back. Um, that we love you um, forever and grateful. So, uh, yeah, come on up. We'd like to invite you some. And just to end that final, just at the end of our service, uh, Pastor the Church would like everyone to come up the front, grab your tamariki from the kids' church, and we'd like to have a big, massive photo up the front here at the end of the service here. So, cool. Hey, uh, kia ora, everybody. Morena, please be seated, and uh, I'll let Ali uh, say something to you. Thank you so much. It was so lovely coming in here today, and I expect lots of hugs at the end. Got some at the beginning, but... Um, Oh, you're amazing. That's all I can say. It was so cool coming in here today, and we've had a great holiday. It was really good for us as a couple. <laughs> it's been getting on a lot better, haven't we? <laughs> we needed to get away and just get a new lease of life, I think. 
and um, the highlight for uh, probably both of us was having time with our girls over there and we missed our beautiful girl back here and Jensen and Nico but um, so it was cool coming home to them as well actually but just having time with Carly and Chari and it was lovely because we saw a bit of their world and where they live and sort of went to Carly's work for a day and she put me to work the day I got there <laughs> but I loved it it was it was really cool so I got to meet the family that she does nannying for and they're so lovely and I was so grateful to them and um, she's very loved and looked after and very happy and yeah and then I get, had a couple of weeks with Shari on my own when um, Johnny was off to Scotland he'll probably tell you about that a little bit so we separated for uh, two weeks and um, he did his thing and then he met Carly again she met him in Poland and they went and did a few things there and I had Shari to myself for a couple of weeks in Italy and it was it was just beautiful just having that one-on-one -on -one and oh, best job in the world is being a mother you know it really is it's just they're just treasures no matter what age they're just it's such a special little gift and um, I feel very blessed actually so yeah I feel younger than I, when I left so <laughs> That's good. And um, yeah, just want to thank everyone, all of you, from the elders right through to all of you for looking after each other and still being here and standing strong. It was That's a blessing for us to be able to go away and have a breather, but come home, know, well, be away and know everything's all right, that you're all okay. And coming in today just was so cool. I love that worship. I've missed that. And I didn't get to any services when I was away. I did go on a Sunday to Paris. I just walked into a church. Our times were all up the chute, and I didn't know where anything was, so it was just a bit random. But I walked into one one day, and I just happened to walk in on a worship practice. And um, it was a bit of the old school, but this beautiful French church, and it just, it was beautiful. And I just sat there for quite a while, and they had the strings. I loved uh, violins and things like that, so they were doing that, and then singing, and and it was just really cool. And then we went to quite a few churches just having a look at them. They're so palatial, but they're, they're quite intimate feeling as well. They're quite, the, the churches we looked at in France were just, um, they were small but so ornate, beautiful. And I said to Johnny, I said, it's funny because you're so surrounded by people all the time in Europe. There's just thousands of people all the time. It's summer over there and all the tourists are there. And and then you can walk into this little haven, this little place of refuge, and it reminded me of here because I thought we really take for granted how precious our church is actually and our place in the world. And um, this is a place of refuge for people here. And I really felt that when I was in France. I thought you walk away from all the, you sort of escape from all the pressure and all the loudness and all the bustle of people and you come into this place just the quietness of it and the beauty of it actually and yeah it was a cool reminder of what we're all here for really building a refuge and a stronghold for here but um yeah it was so it was a very cool holiday and we had a lot of laughs and did a lot of walking and it was good for me so I'm gonna join a gym <laughs> I've been a slap bum so I sort of bought my gear I said to Johnny I'm gonna buy my gear so I have to go to the gym so, yeah, I want to keep up my fitness because I was walking six hours a day over there and my feet were just shot. <laughs> but I kept going because it's so beautiful. You just want to keep looking at everything. But I thought, no, if I want to have trips occasionally, um, I need to have better fitness. But, yeah, I did pretty well. I'm a lot fitter than I was. So, anyway, that's enough from me. you have been waiting to hear from him. <laughs> love you all. Thank you. I love the flowers. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, love. Hey, it was so good to see you. Hey, thank you for that beautiful welcome and um, from everyone, uh, Clark and Elena. That was just so uh, awesome and beautiful. And uh, brothers there and sisters doing the haka. Uh, man, it just just made me think, thanks, guys, um, how much, uh, you know, I love being back in New Zealand. And, and um, to be, you know, a New Zealander is awesome. And actually, I hardly saw or heard any New Zealanders. I saw one fella in a shop with a, uh, a all-black T-shirt on, and I was going to go and say hello, but then I got sidetracked <laughs> and Ned left. But uh, at least already Kiwis over there, actually, which I was a bit surprised. Um, but, yeah, it was um, just so beautiful to be back home, and as much as uh, it was awesome to get away, and it was really lovely to get away. That's 
that's the biggest holiday we've ever had in our lives. And, um, uh, you know, it was probably overdue, really. Um, but it was, it was awesome. And just to have that time um, with Ali and also um, our two other daughters uh, was really special as well. Probably time with family was the highlight, to be honest. People ask, what's your highlight? And um, that was the highlight. Family. Family time together is the most greatest gift from God, I tell you. It is the most greatest gift from God. And we've got to look after our families. We've got to look after one another. One, we've got to prioritize um, our time with our family. Life goes so fast and uh, life goes so quick. And we never know what's around the corner. And uh, so to have quality time in whatever way um, you can is, is, you know, do it. Make it happen somehow. Uh, just don't lose Jesus on the way in, in the house of God. That's the key to that, but to have it, that's for sure. So it's great to be home, and uh, we really wanted flimming cold when I got here, but I thought I'd bring a bit of summer to church today, and <laughs> I got these new clothes, but they're all summer clothes over there, but I thought, oh, no, it's not that cold today, it's sun shining, so oh, well, hallelujah, you know, t-shirt and something else, whatever they call the things, but anyway, uh, so, <laughs> you know, so it's cool um, to be here. Man, we missed you guys, and so good, um, and I... I understand you had a great conference for those who were able to get there, and um, so normally coming off conference, I'd be sharing in the line, but of course, I was away, and when I tried to get on, I couldn't, Then in the last uh, week, has been a lot of travel to get back to, to New Zealand, and so, um, and then get over jet lag, um, is, um, so here we are today, so I'm just, for go off what I, God's put on my heart, but you know, one of the things that Ali uh, referred to it was... Um, one of the things that really touched my heart, I guess, in the God side of things is definitely when we're in France, probably more so than, you know, you go around those European countries and, of course, um, you know, hugely impacted by the power of the gospel and um, churches. And, um, but the churches of France are just a little bit, and we're talking Catholic churches, which is the predominant uh, Christian faith there or, or aspect of our Christian faith. And go into, and over there, there's church every corner. You know, we have dairies every corner in New Zealand. Over there, they have churches, uh, it, literally. You'll go one corner, can I be just three houses away, or that? there's another one. And, you know, a lot of them are open um, during the day and into the later into the evenings. And so, pop in there and have a look. And, and like Ali says, they're, they're quite ornate and quite beautiful. Of course, a lot of them have got, um, you know, the... Uh, what would you call them? You know, all the paintings and all that and, and statues, you know, be hundreds and hundreds of years old and probably worth, uh, you know, couldn't put a price on them, valuable. But anyway, the thing that touched my heart is this, and this is what I'm going to springboard off of my message. The thing that touched me the most, you know, we're in a, a day of social media, TV, Netflix, you know, Prime, you know, all the different you know, neon, all the different things, social media, we carry TVs around in our pockets, we're watching TV in our phones more than ever, you know, wherever you go in the world, you know, and we have all these visuals, and we have all this getting into, that sets up mindsets, it sets up uh, imaging in our minds, it shapes us, etc., well, back in those days, you know, not really a lot of it's not that long ago, but even going back thousands of years or hundreds or even 30 years ago, we didn't have a lot of that. And one of the things that so touched me about the house of God was this, is when you walked into church, where we're now more contemporary, we, we you know, uh, the most cost-effective way to, to have a church is get a warehouse and, and fit it out like we've done. It's the most cost-effective and way to do it. And, but you walk in there, and, and they didn't have all the vision, didn't have TV, and didn't have newspapers and all that even. And so it was all done in paintings, and a lot of that came out of the Renaissance and all that sort of stuff. And they're just amazing, but you saw the theme from one after another after another. You saw the theme of the life and ministry first of Jesus. And often it would go from... That you walk in the door, and on one side you'd see the life and the ministry of Jesus. You'd see him reaching out and giving some water, or 
or on the boat, you know, calming the waters and, or helping a leper. You'd see these in the paintings, beautiful paintings, very old. And then you'd go along and then you'd start to see him being taken, carrying the cross on his way to Golgotha or Calvary, the place of the skull where he was crucified. And you'd see this around the room, this beautiful art form. And then you'd go to the ceilings and now you see him in paradise. And the whole thing gives you this sense and reminder of what Jesus has done for us. And I actually liked it. You know, I actually really loved it. And I saw it better in France than in Greece or Italy. And you think Italy would be at another level. In some ways it was, but, but the French really captivated it. Um, and I loved it. No, I'm a, I'm a Protestant, and we're Protestants, I guess, in the sense that we don't pray to Mary and we don't have some of those things, but a lot of the other stuff is we do believe in and we have similarity and belief and faith in, of course. And, um, but it was so inspiring. And you know what it made you do? It made you contemplate. It made you think. It made you meditate. And I sort of, for the first time, got the sort of caught a little bit why church was quiet and why this could be so foreign to people who are used, more used to that. Now, I wouldn't want to not have what we have here. Actually, what I thought, if I was some real a billionaire, I just about wouldn't say, can I buy that church, lift it up, put it on a ship and bring it out, park it out the back here and just a place you could go and meditate and think and contemplate on God because it was actually really beautiful. It was really nice. I wouldn't want it like that all the time, but there's a place for that, you know? You know what I'm saying? But I was captivated by this. And then coming home, and I'm thinking, you know, well, I wasn't at a conference, so it's hard for me to, to download some of that, and I don't want to mess that up and I'll encourage you to go over your notes and keep walking in that revelation, the spirit of that and the power of that and the, the glory of that. Please continue in that. But what i got to go what was fresh in my heart, and I couldn't help but think the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins. The very foundation of everything we have and will ever have. The very foundation and the heart and the beauty of the great nation that we're called to be and to walk in and be a manifestation of. You know that, that we have been freed from the, 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 the power of sin and the power of darkness and the brokenness that it's brought to our lives and our family that now gives us a hope to strive for something better, to believe for something better, to whatever heights we reach it in this life. And as long as we reach a level, end of the day, that's what really matters. We can't compare ourselves to that one or this one because we'll either feel greater or lesser. We just got to thank you, God, for what I've attained to and what you've attained to. That's what really matters at the end of the day. When you get to heaven, you're not going to be compared to Brother Jack, Joe, Jim, Mary, or Katie. You're going to be compared to just your heart and your faith and your belief that's grounded in the blood and the cross and the forgiveness of sins, of how God sent Jesus into this world to save us, redeem us, lift us up and give us the hope and the life of eternal life. No matter our background, our color, our race, our creed, our beliefs, and what we have done right and what we have done wrong, that He gives us this power and this hope because of the blood and the cross and the forgiveness of sins for all men is a beautiful thing. As I meditated on this and I realized and I looked up some stuff and on what I was thinking about and, and the power of, of how Christianity and Christ, that how God sent His Son into this world has so impacted more beyond what I think we fully realize. It's impacted history and shaped this world way more than what we understand because no one else out there except the church will tell you about it. They're trying to rub the church out of it. They always have. In fact, I stood on places where the blood of martyrs was poured out so that it was just like rivers of blood, they said, from the Christians like you and I who stood for their faith and why we still believe today. I stood where St. Peter was crucified upside down in front of now the Basilica in the Vatican in Rome. But they held on to the blood and the cross and the forgiveness of sins. They infused it into their families and they infused it into society. And we've been robbed of that. 
We've been, that's been taken from us, our whole country and our world, no matter what parts of the world have been impacted by Christ, the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins, like no other movement the world has ever seen. But that history doesn't get shared. That history doesn't get talked about. When I think of the other uh, nearest uh, religion to Christianity, and we'd come up probably with Islam, and how in 610 AD, or if you want to use the non-Christian term CE, which I didn't even know about, but that was taking Jesus out of our calendar, which I'm surprised I was thinking about why they haven't already tried to do that. But anyway, that, that when, when Christ walked this earth, the impact of bringing people closer to God, it in, and history tells us it created a desire to have more connection with God and to have a greater spiritual walk with the Father, and so they, they went looking and how it impacted the, the nations of this world that became Christ and followers of Christ and impacted. And then things turned up and that Christianity was really the, <laughs> the, the stirring and the working that, that created and brought out of that Islam. Where in 610, Muhammad, you know, not Muhammad Ali, but Muhammad, the the prophet for Islam, they wanted their own version. But they wanted to have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah, and they wanted to have Jesus, and it's all in their Quran, their, their Bible. But they wanted to have their version of it because they want. They thought, nah, that's more those people's, or this is our one, and, and they lost that there, and you see where the enemy came in, of course, then you've, you've, you've got the whole um, Isaac and Ishmael thing that I know Apostle spoke about a year or so ago, um, you know, lines come through, I'm not going to go into it, but just the, the power of the, the, of the impact of what? The blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins. The impact that had on this world is astronomical. And I guess even going to a lot of those European countries, and you can see this in, in a lot of other countries I've been to, non-European countries, that power that this brought into the world. And it changed. It changed thinking. It changed mentalities. Because it revealed the benevolence of a God who wants to be close to you. That wasn't around. Not even in Judaism. Which, of course, is our roots. Also the roots of Islam. <laughs> and yet they are enemies. It's crazy. But that's man getting involved there, eh? Man influenced by the enemy of our soul to rob people from knowing Christ, the Son of God. And, and so the world had never really seen the levels of love and benevolence. They'd never heard of a God that would sacrifice his life and himself in the life of his son for those who didn't want to know him, rejected him, hated him, and couldn't care less about him. Never been heard of, never been seen. To look after the poor and the sick and the dying, to lift up the downtrodden and the discouraged and the broken and the poor and the fatherless and the widows, that had never been put up to elevate women to equality with men, had never been seen in, in faiths and, and, and uh, beliefs up until that point. What Jesus did was the greatest revolutionary, the greatest champion of humanity where the world has no doubt ever, ever seen. And now you and I as sons and daughters of God carry that revolutionary spirit of the blood and the cross and the forgiveness of sins, the foundation of a great nation, the foundation of a people that can advance and go and bring back us into the beautiful image of God that you were designed in and created in and to be fulfilled in and to be loved in and to find and experience the glory of yourself in the glory of God. There's such a beauty to be found today like no other place and no other thing. And so we see now that the power of heaven can fill our lives. The power of the Holy Spirit can now come into our hearts and allow us the the power of eternal life and eternal hope and knowing where you will go one day when you pass from this world to the next world. 
that that can live and be a, alive inside of you. Why? Because of the blood and the cross and the forgiveness of sins is at the very foundation, the base and the core of that. And I love it in the book of Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, died for those who didn't want God in their lives. It says they're without strength, and I like that, and I thought about that. He died when we, for us, when we were without strength. In other words, when we were in a weaker position in life, when we were swayed to go here and to go there, all led or just on our own understanding and led by our own desires and led by our own dreams and our own uh, vision and our own heart. And, and we went here, there, based on what we felt was right for us or wanted, be it good or bad or whatever. Swayed, we were in a lesser place. We were without the strength to say no to stuff. We were without the strength or the understanding, for we were still blind by our sins and our trespasses. But even in that place, he says, I'm going to lay my life down for you. I want to redeem you. I want to purchase you back. I want to gather you. I want to rescue you. I, I want to pull you into something better for you, your family, your nation, your community, your future. Oh, this is so beautiful. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. And then it says this, but God demonstrates, God proves, God reveals his own love toward us. And that while we were still sinners, why we're still naughty, why we're still carrying the stain of our sins and our wrongs and our darkness, still carrying the monsters in our heads, the demons in our hearts, the lacks, the loss, the traumas, the hurt, the pain, the confusion, the, un, the lack of understanding. He says, why we're still sinners, Christ Jesus, God himself died for you. Who would lay down their life for you? Maybe a parent, but not all parents would. Or we could say we would, but not all would. Maybe a friend, maybe you think they would, but would they when it came down to it? Beautiful story when um, Carly and I, I met her in uh, Poland, um, mainly the reason because when I had my accident and it was going a bit rough, uh, down in Wellington, and she says, Dad, why don't we go to Auschwitz? Because her and I used to watch a lot of um, uh, uh, history programs on World War II, and yeah, <laughs> it sounds a bit gr grim, doesn't it? But anyway, you know, and she says, why don't we go there? I had some friends who went there, and they said it was amazing. Why don't we go there? And it was really a, a, a place that really gave me some light and psychologically strength to say, I can get through this. You know, and they said, you're not going to walk and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, I'm going to walk again, you know, even though I had days where I didn't think that. But you know what I'm saying. And it was real hope, and, and I held on to that. And, and, and you know, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, it might have been, um, two weeks ago, we went there together. And it was a real fulfillment of, and I visualized this as I laid in bed, as, you know, I was pumped with every blimmin' thing, and da-da-da. I visualized us walking in there. I was all, and, and I visualized with my arm around you, and we did that as we left Auschwitz too. That's the one where you see the train going under the big arch, that one there. Um, and we walked out of there, and I said, I've got to put my arm around you, Carly. And so it was, oh, it was really awesome, you know. It was a beautiful moment. But we were in Auschwitz one, something that really spoke to my heart. And we went downstairs, and that's where they killed one and a half million Jews in World War II. Mainly Jews. There was gypsies, and there was Poles, and there was Rus uh, Russian soldiers and, and others, um, but predominantly uh, Jewish people. Um, and, and we'd go down, and they took us down to the starvation chambers. We'd go, go past, they'd just starve them to death. Horrible stuff. The whole thing was blooming horrible, but... Anyway, um, and there was a young man who was sentenced for whatever reason, just because of his race, to starve to death. We walked down the stairs, we looked into the cells, the cells were probably about, I don't know, about half the size of this here, 
wooden bit of stake. You walk in there, you never walk out. Men, women, young people, old people, you die of starvation and thirst. Horrific, eh? But there was a man who knew the power of the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins. I can't repeat to you even his name because I'm not sure if she even said his name to a guy. But he was a priest, a believer, a son of God. A man who had been touched by the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins through Christ. And the day this one young man, I don't know if you'd ever seen him, knew him, I don't know the story. But he put his hand up and he says to the SS Gestapo guard, can I take his place? A certain sentence to a horrible death. And they said, yes. Get this other one out of here. Treat them like animals. Chuck him in there. So they chucked the priest, the believer, the son of God into a cell. And of course he died. I'm not sure how many days it took for him to die, but he died. That young man he rescued that day, went on to live to old age. He had children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and children have still been born because of one act of love, of benevolence, of kindness, of grace, of incredible strength. How did that happen? Because he knew of the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins. Because of the love of God that was shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Spirit, he laid his life down like Christ laid his life down for you and I. And he perished. I don't even know if they know his name. They might have his name or they probably would have his name, but I don't know it, but I know the story. And I was moved by that. That's the thing that moved. I thought I'd cry. I had my sunglasses ready to put on and not let anyone see the tears, you know, but I didn't have any of that through. There was too many people, I think, and so rushed going through so much to see, so overwhelming. I didn't actually get emotionally moved, but that did. The story of someone who knew what we know and who gave his life because of the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins that comes from Christ. You see, where it says, while we were still sinners, it says, in other words, let's listen to this. We may have been alienated from God. But listen, he was never alienated from you. You might not have wanted God, walked with God. Maybe someone's here today that couldn't, you know, you haven't walked with God and you're not sure should you walk with God or you're not sure you're in that place of trying to work it out and, and, and understand, do I need him or don't I? How does it work? And all those sort of things. But I want to tell you, God has never been alienated from you. God has been with you all the time. Right from the conception with your mum and dad to, the, to right up here today, God has always been there. He is only a prayer away. He's a step away. He is right beside you. He's always been there, even though you might have so many questions about the same. How the hell did he let that happen then? Or why did this happen? And I've had them too. But all I know is this. And all our traumas and darkness and disappointments and the horrors maybe of your life, I know God has always been there because of the blood and the cross and the forgiveness of sins. He's never left you. He's never not been available to you. It's us who's been away from him. And it's to us today, he reaches out into your world and my world and my nation and your nation and your family and your children and your extended family and friends and says, I'm here and I want to come back inside. He knocks on the door of your heart and he says, will you let him in? The door handles on the inside is not on the outside. And if you would open the door of your heart today, even if you're a believer, that the freshness of hearing just the complete simplicity of the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins, that would refresh you, stir you, motivate you, lift you, move you, make you think more and contemplate more, meditate more, and praise Him more. While we're still sinners, He died for us. He's always been invested in us. Says that we're justified by his blood. 
In other words, just if you'd never sin. Imagine all your sins as far as God is concerned. If you've confessed them, asked them to forgive you, he goes, what sin? What, eh? It's not because he's got dementia, Alzheimer's, or he's whacked out on coke. No, it's because he chooses to forgive every one of your transgressions. He holds nothing against you. That's the power of our God. That's the, I tell you, the world and our organizations and governments and this one and that one, even friends and family will hold against you your wrongs. They will hold against your misgivings. They will hold you to a certain image or a certain look. But I want to tell you, God doesn't look at you that way. God doesn't hold you bound to your past. God looks past everything, outwardly and inwardly, and he sees who he created you to ultimately be, and that's a champion, to be a man and a woman of success, to be a man and a woman who can overcome every obstacle, get through every mountain, go through every valley, no matter how low or so high, God is the power, he's the wind underneath your wings, my brothers and my sisters, to fly again, to go again, to do better again. Don't be held by your past or your sins or your wrongs because our God loves you too much to leave you there. He wants to advance you and there's something bigger and better because of the blood and the cross and the forgiveness of sins. Wow. That's the message that revolutionized the world. So I know it's the message that revolutionized my life. When God stepped into that broken heart of a young teenager, that moment I stood in that court dock and I was off to, you know, to jail, and God turned it all around and I walked out of there. And Jesus stood with the moment that judge said, we better look in the best interests of this kid, this young man, in social welfare care, lost, broken, full of hate, bitterness, brokenness, perversion, every foul, ugly thing that I thought was normal, <laughs> I thought was good, I thought was cool, I thought was the best way to live. Suddenly Jesus turns up in the blimmin' courtroom. And I was up for class A drugs, but I wasn't stoned. <laughs> I was straight as a die that day. I was too nervous because <laughs> I didn't want to go to jail, to be honest. But you know what? He brought forgiveness because of the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins. doesn't matter how old or how young when you receive Jesus. He washes away your past. doesn't matter tattoos you have. It doesn't matter the looks you carry. doesn't matter on any of that. He looks beyond that and he sees the power, the beauty, the glory of who you really are. Others will define you as this person or that person, but my God defines you as one he loves, one he cherishes, and one he cares for. Oh, the power of the blood and the power of the cross and the forgiveness of sins is overwhelming. It's so big, it's so deep, it's so powerful, it's so simple. It's so easily lost in our walk, in our faith. But I want you to hold on to it like nothing else. I want you to have that place in your heart, in your homes, where Jesus is just number one. That moment you'll just pause and you'll just have a little thought and you go, wow, God, you're cool, man. That moment where you'll maybe fall to your knees in tears and fear, anxiety and worry and condemnation and failure and just say, God, help me. That moment you'll just take a second and just say, God, you thank you for that. You're awesome. Thank you for that breakthrough. This is the best life. No matter what it might be that you grab him for a speck of a moment or longer, whatever it might be, and you pull him into your world afresh every day. Keep him alive and afresh every day, no matter what we go to go through. So I love it in Revelations 1, 5, and it says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. In Revelation 7, 14, it says, 
These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. And they washed their robes and they made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You know, I don't usually wear white t-shirts because you can guarantee <laughs> this little parlang, he's going to spill something down the front. <laughs> I was having a coffee and I just about knocked it over. Oh, don't do that now, you know. That's why I normally won't because, you know, it looks horrible. You've got a stain on a white t-shirt or, hey, you know. <laughs> um, but you know what? Our, that's what sin does. It stains us. I thank goodness <laughs> if I... Stain my shirt, <laughs> which is likely to happen, that there's a thing called, I had to ask Ellie this, what's that stuff called? Sard, she said. I, I, you know, I don't know much about sard, but I know that sard removes stains. Makes your t-shirt look good and crisp and white again. Thank you, Jesus. You know what the blood of Jesus does? It takes stain of sin. Sin stains you. Naughtiness stains you. Dumb stuff stains you. You would never go out with egg stains and coffee stains and tomato sauce from your fish and chip stains. You wouldn't go out on a date. You wouldn't go out even with your mates with stains all down your T-shirt. You'd either change it for a black one, chuck it out. That's why black is always good, right? <laughs> and, and yet we carry stain. But it says they washed their robes and they made them white. They washed their robes and they made them white. And it says, in the blood of the lamb, wouldn't that make them red? That's like sad. It just takes the stain out. It doesn't take you out. It takes the stain. And the stain gets taken out of your heart. It gets taken off your life. You might not be able to see it, possibly, but they're there. You don't have to walk around with egg down your front anymore, church, because the blood of Jesus takes away the stain. He applies the spiritual sard to cleanse you and make you whole again before him. How beautiful is that? I love it in Isaiah 1 verse 18 that says this, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, in other words, like red standing out, red tomato sauce down your white T-shirt, they should be as white as snow. And though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. How beautiful is that? See, God takes away the stain so that you can walk free before him. Now listen, something beautiful has had a bit of fresh revelation on last night. Is there something really beautiful that happened when Jesus was first taken prisoner to be crucified? And in Matthew 27, 28, you can look at it there in your own time. It says, they stripped Jesus of all his clothes. What did they put on him? They put a scarlet robe on him. And I understand that diff one of the things with scarlet, it can speak of royalty like purple does because red was a very difficult color to dye things in. And it, the Romans um, used a, sea sh a type of seashell. Um, you know, I'm not sure which one it was, but they used the seashell. The Hebrews, very really interesting, they used an insect. And it was an insect that attacked uh, oak trees or something like that. And they, they found inside this insect, this red dye, and they extracted out of an insect that color, and they would dye their garments red. Hence why only the wealthy wore red. So red doesn't only speak of the blood of Christ. It speaks of wealth and royalty in the Bible. But let's look at it. And that, they were partly mocking him here, calling him, you know, king of the Jews. So they're using partly in a world, ungodly way, mocking his royalty. That's another story there. But what they didn't realize is they were historically, and this is where the devil's, devil is so dumb. They were historically revealing one of the greatest truths that the New Testament church, the Christian church, you could put it maybe, 
uh, would ever know is this, that Jesus took upon all your sin. And when they took off his clothes, his divinity and sort of humanity all at once, so they thought, they put a, a, a scarlet robe upon him. It shows you the point where he took on, the Bible says, all the sin of man. He took on, Isaiah there, the scarlet robes that spoke of your sin. That he took on the scarlet robes so that your sin stains could be turned as white as snow. That all your stains and all your misgivings and all your trespasses, be them a little bit or be them massive. Jesus put on the robe that indicates to you he took your wrongs and he took your sins and he took your bad and he took your ugly and he put it upon himself. So that you would never, ever have to carry the shame of a wrong decision, a past indiscretion. You could walk free from guilt and condemnation. And you could walk bold and courageous throughout your life. And be who God made you to be. (laughs) The Roman soldiers didn't know they were actually being used by God. He took upon your sin. You see, the Bible says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You are now the righteousness of God, not on what you've done or haven't done, but because you were given the gift of the blood and the cross and the forgiveness of sins. When God looks at you, you're white like this T-shirt. Hopefully it stays white. But it'll, you are like that before God now. You're not stained or blotted. You're not cast out. You're not pushed aside. You're not undervalued. He values you. Others might not value you, but God ever intrinsically, gloriously values your life. It's so important to Him. You and your troubles and your lacks, you are so important to Him. He's invested into you. Such a wonderful thing. So the Bible says a few scriptures here because I so want you to catch this. In 1 John 1, 7, one of my all-time greats, if we walk in the light as he is in the light and we have fellowship with one another, that's why we've got to become part of a church. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So there's a stain here and the blood comes and washes it. It just attacks the sin. It doesn't attack you. It just attacks the sin. It's the... Gobbles it all up. Oh, I've got a white T-shirt again. White robes of righteousness again. Isn't that wonderful? He says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. Man, isn't that awesome? He redeemed us. In other words, this, Jesus purchased you. I'm purchased. I was a slave to sin. He came along, purchased me, redeemed me, redeemed you, purchased you, and set you free from being a slave. We were once all slaves, man. We were all manacled, you know. When I went to the Colosseum in Rome, that was, I didn't know this, that was um, done, um, uh, built by Jewish slaves. I would say thousands of them would have died there as well. Incredible, just out the gate crazy. Slaves, manacled. But Jesus sets us free. He purchased us, it says in the book of Acts, uh, by his own blood. Let me finish with two fellas in the New Testament. Because this is the transforming power of your life. Other things will touch you, restore you, lift you up, help you be a bit better, which is great. But nothing will transform your life than this, is the understanding and the revelation of the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins. There was a fellow in the Bible called Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. He was a rich man. He was a prominent member of the religious council of the Pharisees and Sadducees and those groups of of people. He also, which is pretty cool, a secret disciple of Jesus. He was a man, it says, waiting for the kingdom of God to come. It says that he was a good man and a just man. Uh, But when, listen to this, he was a secret follower. He He was prominent. He had stature in community. He had wealth. But when he saw the blood and the cross of Christ, this one man he he knew was the son of God, but he struggled for whatever reason, and it don't really matter, to be honest. He struggled with coming out being a Christian. 
<laughs> Funny way to say it, but he did. He struggled with it. So he was a bit of a secret follower. High fight Jesus, but the rest of the time, he was one of the only ones who did not, it says in the Bible, that he did not consent to the crucifixion or the, the arresting, should I say, of Jesus. He didn't consent to that, all behind the scenes. But when he saw, and it's in four of the Gospels, so that's telling you something powerful about this man, this moment. When he saw the horror of the cross and the blood that was shed and what he went through as the Son of God for all humanity, it says that he courageously, the word it uses, went in before Pilate, knowing he was a wealthy man, a rich man, a prominent religious leader in his community. He forgot about all his wealth and the possible loss of it. He forgot about he could literally be also next one on the chopping block from the Pharisees and the, and the Romans. He went in and he says, give us the body of Jesus. Let us bury it before the Sabbath the next day. Let us bury him. Do our customs with him. And Pilate was moved by the boldness and courage of this man and gave him the body, his body. And he took the body, clothed Jesus in linen, washed his body, clothed it in linen, and went and put it in his rich man's tomb that the Bible says he had just hewn out of the, the rock wall. And they put the, the, the stone over it. They got rolled away by the angel the, the next few, three days later. And they buried him. You see, when he saw the blood and realized the power of the cross changed his life, he was a follower already. Beautiful thing, right? But it took it to another level transformed him deeper on the inside and he became one of the bold and the brave and when you understand the blood and the cross and the forgiveness of your sins you will become one of the bold and the brave you will get a courage that will cause you to stand up and not worry about what others think of you it's a beautiful there is another man thomas one of the 12 disciples it says there thomas in John 11, verse 6, it says, Thomas was willing to die with Jesus. He loved Jesus. He was willing to die for, for his friend, the Son of God. But he struggled with believing. He's known as doubting Thomas, but I don't want us to have that picture of him. That's just, and some historian wrote that. I see him as something greater. I see him as a man who moved past his trauma. You imagine someone you loved, respected, honored, followed, willing to give your life for, gets ripped out from your sort of friendship protection, dragged away, whipped, mocked, spat upon, degraded, put down, and then led up the hill and crucified one of the most horrendous deaths, you could, total torture. Tell me you couldn't be traumatized by that knowing you had no power to change it because you had all of Rome there and you had all those against it. And he was a traumatized man. How couldn't you be? Think about it. How couldn't you be? He was traumatized. He was, and what he did with his trauma this is what people do, not everyone, but some people, they shut down and then they go into human understanding and they struggle with believing God and the finer points of the faith of God, how God can help you, what God said is actually true. You struggle with this. Now I'm hitting some hearts. You struggle with this because of trauma. You struggle with this and it, and it manifests in people as, I struggle to believe that. I'll only believe it if I see it. And so he says, he misses the first encounter of Jesus' appearance with the disciples. He's the one who misses out. It was on purpose. God was setting, a, he was setting up Thomas to heal him because Thomas became a great revolutionary. And, and he missed it. So they says, we saw Jesus. He came back. He told us, he says, get out of here. He's traumatized, man. He's shut down. He struggles to believe. He's lost hope. He, he, he's been, had his life, had him differently to maybe the others, but it, that's his reality, right? And he says, unless I can see and touch the holes in his hands and the feet and put my hand into his side, he says, then I will believe. 
Not that he didn't believe Jesus was there, but he struggled to believe his resurrection, the finer points of Christ. And so he carries on. Three days later, it says, I think it was eight, maybe whatever. It comes on, and Jesus turns up, bodily form, walks through the wall. <laughs> it's just, you, our brains can't understand that, right? He's standing there, you know, you imagine his jaw hits the ground. And, he, and Jesus then repeats his words. He says, Thomas, come. He says this. This word is powerful. He says, reach out. Reach, 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 reach. Touch the holes in my hand. Reach. He says, reach your hand. Read it there. Reach your hand into my side. Big hole from the spear. Reach your hand into my side. God moved him, transformed him, was about to take him out of trauma, the struggle to believe, and into a place of incredible faith. And he reached out and he said this. He says, my Lord, my God. Jesus didn't condemn him. He went on and says, you know, blessed if you believe, but he was helping and teaching us. But he took him. He didn't condemn him for not believing. He didn't condemn him that he didn't stand with the 12 saying, yeah, we saw Jesus. He was the opposite. But Jesus came and says, I'm going to move you through your trauma. I get you, Thomas. I love you, Thomas. You're special. You're unique. You're not like everybody else. I like that, Thomas, about you. Don't lose you. Don't compare you because Jesus doesn't. And he says, and he healed him. Thomas, you can read in the history books, went on toured the world, even ended up in India. In fact, India claims that he died on one part of their island on the left side of it. I don't know if he did or not, but anyway, he he went out and revolutionized the world for Christ because God healed him, took him out of unbelief. You're struggling with unbelief today. You have places where you don't believe. You say, I can believe that, but that, too far. I don't get it. Part of the reason I'm not saying every reason, but part of the reason is trauma has stopped the ability to believe. But God is here today by his blood and the cross and the forgiveness of sins to heal your heart, give you your break. See, he says reach. Reach because you have to sometimes reach and touch him. You've got to reach past the trauma. You've got to reach past the, the failure, the discouragement, the hurt, the disappointment, whatever it might be. And you have to say, God, I believe, and let God then the power come back into you through him, into you. Healed his life because of the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins. Jesus said to the the great nation, because I want to pick up where Apostle was, the great nation of the church, he says in Daniel 11, verse 32, he says, for they will know their God, and shall be strong, and they shall do great exploits. And that church is us today. We know him, and we shall be strong, and we shall go and do great exploits in his name. Why? Because that underneath it and girding us all along is what? The blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins is the power of the church added to it, resurrection life, filled now with God and His Spirit. Now God is not up there. God is in here. We shall win and be strong and do great exploits because of the blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins. Please stand to your feet today. Maybe you're here today. And you want Jesus in your life. Maybe you've been away and distant from Him, but you don't have to stay there because He is not distant to you. In fact, He's even heard your prayers and He's heard your crying out to Him. He's heard it. I know God heard all my prayers before I started going to church and being a Jesus follower and a God-goer fella, all that stuff. He hears them. And you want Jesus in your life today? There might only be one, there might be none. I don't know, but I want to give the opportunity right now that if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you haven't experienced the power of His blood, the cross, and the forgiveness of sins, today you can be forgiven because of that blood and that cross. 
And if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer before you go and have a kai and go home and start your new week ahead. I want you to go home knowing there ain't no stain on you, my brother. There ain't no stain on you, my sister. There ain't no stain that he can't wash away. There ain't no stain. The roof didn't fall in when you came in here because God is way bigger and he's looked past your sin all your life. He's not even really that concerned about it. You might be and you need to be and I need to be, but he's bigger. If that's you, I want you to pray this prayer from your heart because that's what it's all about. It's here, man. It's your heart. It's your heart that matters. Pray this with me. Dear Jesus, I ask today that you'd forgive me of all my sins, all my dumb stuff. Please now cleanse me. Wash me. Remove the stains that I might sparkle nice and clean like a white (laughs) t-shirt Lord I ask you to be my Lord and Savior to lead me and guide me for the rest of my days lead me through the valleys and help me enjoy the mountain tops in Jesus name I pray Amen. Let's give them a big round of applause because that, to be honest, I just find that lovely praying it myself. (laughs) Ah. You know, if you prayed that today for the first time, you prayed that because you want to come back to God or this is your first time, I don't know. If that was you, I want you to put your hand up and just say, Pastor John, that was me today. Awesome, my brother. Mean, man. Fantastic. Anybody else today? Anybody else today? I just want to know anyone walking out of here, there's no weight on your shoulders. Oh, bless you, brother. Awesome, my man. That's the one. That's the one. Anyone else? Any of our sisters today? Awesome. Bless you. Bless you, brothers. Hey, I'm going to finish the meeting in a minute. Could you two brothers shortly come up the front? I'd just love to shake your hand. I'll pray for you as well if you'd like to. The two brothers. Yeah, yeah, come now. That's awesome. Oh, I like that. Be bold. Mean as. Awesome, guys. Fantastic. Well, let's do this. Let's pray for these brothers as a church. Hey, awesome, my man. Thank you.